Sonia is saying, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, Sonia. How do you recommend to choose a title for your book? Whew, uh, Sonia, that answer has a lot of, that question has a lot of answers. Um, Sonia, why don't you tell everyone, go to the Q&A box and tell everyone a little bit about your next book. What is it about? Don't give the title. But I would like uh, any of you who want to go to the question and answer box and tell me a little bit about your book. Give me a one sentence description of what it's about. Uh, feel free also to go to, if you're watching this live on Facebook, drop what your book is about without giving me the title into the comment section and let's come up with a few titles together. So I'm going to answer your questions about how to title your book by walking through the process that I go through with my clients and I'm happy to do that. So we're gonna take a moment, we're gonna let Sonia and whomever wants to drop in their book description or what their book's about, do that. And while they're doing that, I'll answer a question or two from the email. Vicki, Vicki S has asked, that so, says someone told her that she has to find out about her book subject BISAC codes. How important is this? What's a BISAC? How do I find a BISAC? How do I do it? All right, Vicki, I am happy to answer that for you. For those of you who have who are aware of BISAC codes, you can just kind of go get a cup of coffee for the next few minutes. But I would like to walk you guys through what a BISAC code is and why it's important. B-I-S-A-C. Capital B, capital I, capital S, capital A, capital C. BISAC. Now, BISAC is an acronym. Let me share my screen with you guys so I can show you, um, let's see, a little bit about what I'm talking about here. All right, hopefully you guys can see that I am on the Book Industry Study Group website right now. And I have jumped ahead to their BISAC page. A BISAC is an acronym. And uh, the acronym stands for, I believe, Book Industry Standards and Coding. Let me see. Um, let's see. What are, what does BISEC stand for? Book Industry Standards and Communications. See, this is why you should never trust me. But what a BISEC code is, and you can learn all about BISECs by going to the BISG, Book Industry Study Group, so BISG.org. You can go to their webpage and learn more about BISEC codes. But what BISEC codes are, BISEC codes are a, 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 a series of codes that the book industry study group in conjunction with a lot of other international organizations have put together. They are a standardized group of subject codes that retailers and wholesalers and, the, and a lot of different organizations across the globe use as a standardized way to get the categories, the genres in line. And this particular group of codes is governed by the Book Industry Study Group and a few other organizations that all join together. And once a year, sometime around November or so, they will put out every year the new refreshed BISAC codes. That doesn't mean that they are constantly retiring old ones. They're not constantly updating, but they are adding some new ones every year. Uh, we do not have the 2020 yet. We do have the 2019. They came out in November. So let me share with you some of the codes that you will find if you look up the 2019 codes, a complete list of the 2019 BISEC subject headers. There's antiques and collectibles. These are headers. These are general headings. So my book is a business book. So I would go right to business and economics. And so the header is business and economics, but then there's subheadings. And so I would look for a subheading. Now my book, I would argue, is a business book, but it's mainly about marketing. So I would go down to marketing. But what if I didn't know that? What if I thought, well, my book's a book about about the publishing industry. So I would use publishing and I would arrow down their alphabetical and I would try and find publishing. Hmm, there isn't a code for publishing. Well, maybe it's under books. So then I'd arrow up to books, business. And I'd say, no, nothing about books. There's bookkeeping. So there is no subject code, a, a subheader 
under business and economics that has to do with book publishing. Okay, I get that. This is not the same list as the Amazon codes, guys. Don't get them confused. They look somewhat similar. But if I decided that I wanted to say that the first buy set code that I wanted to go into was about marketing, look at all these different markets. There's marketing general, marketing direct, marketing industrial, which means marketing business to business uh, at a higher level, international marketing. Multi-level marketing is not about my book. I'm not about network marketing or multi-level marketing. Research, uh, telemarketing, mentoring and coaching. Now we're outside of, um, truthfully, the most, the, the, the closest subgenre I have is marketing general. So business economics, marketing general would be my first buy set code. And right there, that code is BUS043000. That is a code that Barnes and Noble needs, Ingram needs, Baker and Taylor needs. If you work with a wholesaler or a retailer, and especially if your book is going up through Ingram Spark, you should have as many BISAC codes as is appropriate. The book industry study group and the BISAC folks, folks will tell you that best practices is to get as specific as possible. Please do not just say that you've got a general business book. That does not help you. BISAC codes are specifically designed to help bookstores and to help some librarians. A lot of librarians still use the Dewey Decimal System and PCIP codes and, and that thing, but, but it is a, it's a place for wholesalers and bookstores to determine very quickly what category your book's in. So if you have got a novel, let's say you've got a fiction book, and let's say it's a political thriller, what you would do is you would go to fiction. I hope you guys can still see this. And then you'd arrow down probably to thriller. Ooh, look, mystery and detective is everywhere. Now, some people think that thrillers are a subsection of mystery, but I, I can tell you recently in the last few years that thriller has become its own section. It's no longer a mystery subsection. So there's all, here's fiction, here's all the thrillers, but a general, you know that yours is a political thriller. So don't say general, go right to fiction, thrillers, political. And there is your BISAC code. If your book is a political thriller and it also is a psychological thriller, then you can put your second BISAC code in. You don't need to choose. You can put up to three BISAC codes into the databases that are asking for BISAC codes. For those of you who are wondering, who needs a BISEC code? Everybody. You need to know your top two BISEC codes. If, unless your book is so specific that it only has one, having two or three BISEC codes uh, in your materials will really impress the book buyers. And even on, put them on your book sheets. Have them ready when you upload to Ingram Spark. Put them on your book sales sheets. Booksellers need them. Sue is saying she thought you could only pick three BISEC codes, not as many as you want. That's true. Um, so you can only pick three BISAC codes for Ingram Spark, but you, you, and best practices, uh, according to BISAC is no more than three. You can pick as many as you want. You just can't put them everywhere. Um, and you look a little silly having six BISAC codes, have two, maybe three, two or three. All right. So, Sue, so that was a, a very, a, if I said you can have as many as you want, I didn't mean it that way. Sorry. What I meant was you can pick whichever ones you want, but make sure you're being as accurate as possible. All right. So that, I believe, answers the question about BISAC codes. But if you have any questions about BISAC codes, please just go to BISG.org, Book Industry studygroup.org, BISG.org, and they will be able to, to, you can just frequently ask questions. There's lots of places to go. Let's go back to the question about how do you title a book? What is the process that you go through to title a book? Sonia has asked if, you know, for a little bit of help on this. So let's take it through the process that I go through with my clients. Sonia has a self-help guide to help happily un unhappily married people, both men and women, make the decision to divorce or to save their relationship. There are techniques that she's come up with that powers them through to the next step, whether it's to stay in their marriage or to move on. It's to help them get past that whole, 
eh, you know, it's not good, it's not bad. It's to break them out of the status quo and help them make a decision to actually work on and save the relationship or to split permanently and how to do that. It's a guide. It's a self-help book. So Sonia, the thing I would do to start is I would find the biggest problem that you are helping people solve. And I would start with a subtitle. And that's how I work. So I'm just giving you my process. So your book, the, sub, the, the title has a job. A book's title, the job is to catch the eye and the imagination and the interest of the reader. It is not the title's job to describe everything the book is about. The title's job is to grab the eye, the interest, and the imagination of your potential reader, your potential purchaser. Does this book interest me? That's the title's job. It is the subtitle's job to explain to the reader what, what the book's about and whether or not it's a good fit for them. So Sonia, let's start with a subtitle. The subtitle of your book is something along the lines of um, uh, uh, break, out, break out of status quo and, you know, or something along the lines of, of uh, getting out, it's getting unstuck, getting unstuck from the mire of, of a relationship and deciding whether or not to move forward or to break up or um, uh, how to get past your fear of divorce and actually take the next empowering steps. There's so many subtitles. You know your book best, but write the subtitle first. You know, a guide to a guide for unhappily married couples um, is could be a good subtitle. Or um, uh, uh, a step by step decision making guide to divorce or staying together. There's write up as many subtitles as you want, and you will quite often find the you will quite often find the title of your book in that subtitle. So right now I'm thinking for a book like yours, I said, you know, get unstuck. Well, I like the idea of unstuck as a title. Unstuck, uh, a guide for unhappily married people who feel trapped in their relationship. Uh, or you can say, um, or you, the title of the book can be, um, you are not trapped or you are not stuck. And it can be a step-by-step -step guide to determining whether or not your marriage is worth saving. Uh, how to get divorced happily uh, or happily divorced. You can come up with so many intriguing titles by writing out the subtitle first. So that is an exercise that I would suggest you do, Sonia. Is that you, don't start with the title. Start with the subtitle. Write five, six, eight, as many as you want of them where you really outline in, in a few words exactly what the book does. And then by the time you've got all those subtitles, you're going to have a whole bunch of great little mini phrases that might make fantastic titles. Now that is how I would title a book for a nonfiction author like Sonia's. I asked you guys to, if anyone had any... Um, Linda's suggesting 50 ways to leave your lover. Now, Paul Simon might have a problem with that title. Make sure <laughs> that you're not in violation of copyright law. But yes. Um, so when you've written a nonfiction book, uh, that is how I would go about it. I'm going to quickly glance to Facebook to see if anyone dropped their title in there. Um, Apparently, Wendy Vanderpoel has joined us by phone this morning. Wendy, I need to let you know I loved those earrings you posted so much that I went and bought two pair. You have to drop me your address in, uh, in the DM over here in the direct message because when they come in, I'm going to send you a pair. I was so thrilled to find those. Um, you are an angel. I just We have such the same taste. And I love them so much. I bought you a pair and me a pair. So drop your address in there and we will... Uh, we will get on that. All right. So let's see if anyone else has put their title into the Facebook chat or their, their book description. Uh, because I want to see if I can work with a fiction book for someone. Let's we see. All right. All right. Uh, Jeanette, Tammy, I do see your questions. I'm going to, um, at the moment, I'm just going to stick with this titling question for a second, but then I will get to them. Uh, you got in in plenty of time. 
jump, jump, jump. I do not see any fiction titles. So I don't have anything to work on at the moment with fiction, but fiction's a little different. Taking a general theme and using what I do with fiction a lot is I look at the best-selling titles and I see whether or not upcoming books are, if the titles are trending long or short or if they're punchy and going with that. So Sonia, that's my advice. I hope it helped. Uh, let's get to the next questions. Oh, excuse me, guys. One moment. You know I love my Diet Coke. I can't get through the morning without it. All right. Sue is saying, question about co-authors of books. She is the co-author of a popular book. She is. It's a very popular book in her niche. She's working on a three-book series partially based on that book. Her co-author has been in bad health for years. I'm sorry to hear that. And also, oh, and also has dementia. Um, unfortunately, he may not be with us for a long time. So Sue wants to know if she should continue to put his name on the cover and list him as a co-author. And if so, what does she need to do to the interior it, when he's no longer with us? Sue, I'm afraid that this depends on your contract with your co-author. Uh, and different publishers and different authors have different agreements. I know that, that some of the publishers that I worked for when they, when they work out a contract with the co-authors, they only sign the contract with one author, and that author has a contract with the other author. Some of them sign with both. If you have an agreement with that author that does not take into account what happens upon their demise, then for the most part, I, I, I'm not a legal expert. You're going to need to check with a lawyer. But if you, have a, if you have an agreement with them that their heirs get, you know, 50% of the rights or whatever, then you need to do what they, what they ask for. I'm afraid this is a legal question, not a publishing question. Whether or not you can continue to use their name uh, is up to the contract and is up to their heirs and is up to his estate. Um, and I'm so sorry to hear that he's not well, but I'm afraid that this is more of a legal question than a publishing question. Once the legalities are worked out, you can keep his name, you can take his name off, you can keep the series going under your own name and not include his. Just because he's got his name on the first book in the series, if you own the publishing rights to the series, you can publish as many copies, as many versions of that book, as long as you're not using his content or his ideas, which he has, he's agreed to give you to use for the first book. That I can tell you, but um, as for the rest, I am afraid that's more of a legal question, and as much as I'd love to answer it, I would get in a lot of trouble. You do not want to take legal advice from me. I am, I'm, I'm only out of prison by the good auspices of the fine folks of the South Burlington Police Department who are nice to me. All right. Uh, Wendy H., not Wendy Vanderpool, but Wendy H., is asking about VAs. She just was listening to a webinar about hiring a VA. And this particular company charges about $300 a month. They vet the VAs and there's one day turnaround on an unlimited number of jobs. You can have an unlimited number of jobs for $300 a month. Wendy, I need to know who this company is, holy moly. But she doesn't know if she has enough work to make it worth $300 a month. Can I talk about how much we pay for a VA, where to find ones who have been vetted, practical ideas of how you work with a VA? I'd be happy to. I suggest VAs all the time, but there's different VAs for different tools. There is a woman named Kelly Johnson from Cornerstone. Cornerstone is based out in Boulder, Colorado. Kelly is a very tech savvy VA. She knows all about websites. She knows about coding. She knows about apps. She knows about tech. When, when somebody has a lot of tech and website needs, I go right to Cornerstone virtual assistant, Kelly Johnson. However, Social media, when I want a virtual assistant to do my social media work, mm, easy breezy marketing. Luana, I love Luana, she's fantastic. So it depends on what you need. If what you're looking for is a virtual assistant to be a girl Friday, which is the most sexist phrase I've ever said. I can't believe I just said girl Friday. Okay, I'm gonna edit that out when, when this is a, as a replay. But if you want a VA to simply just do your bidding, to just be your assistant, I love people per hour. Using a service that has a whole bunch of different VAs that have different skill sets is definitely the way to go. And Wendy H., um, paying $300 a month for an unlimited number of jobs would be a deal. 
I pay anywhere from $30 to $60 an hour for my VAs, my virtual assistants. So if you can get an unlimited number of jobs, you know what you can have them do? You can have them emailing and calling up and harvesting email addresses for libraries and bookstores and cities for you. There's a job. You can have them going online and finding and identifying all of the Facebook groups that are discussing your topic. There's something you can get them to do. You can have them create a calendar for you and, and have them drop in articles that they found on certain topics. You can give them three topics that you find interesting and that are connected to your book and have them you know, fill a three month or a 90 day calendar with dropped in links of articles that they found on that topic that you can then review. You can have them upload your books to Ingram Spark. You can have them research ebook designers. There's, there's nothing you can't ask a VA to do. And if you're using a service like People Per Hour or some of these services, you will often find that you're working with a whole team of VAs that have different skill sets. So, Wendy, I, I, at $300 a month, that's a pretty good deal. But I would definitely take a look at the, at the fine print. And I want to know who that company is because I could load up 40 or 50 hours a week in jobs just off the top of my head for $300 a month. That would save me an, an enormous amount of money. So, uh, whew, love that one. All right. Let's see the next question. Wendy, the same Wendy H is saying that the title process that I went through is the exact title process she went through. So that's wonderful. Um, uh, Sue is saying that the co-author had given her all the intellectual rights to his property, but did he, did he give you any, did he give you all the publishing rights? As long as that's cool. So, Sue, I'm not arguing with you. I'm, I just, whew. All right. Uh, Annette. Annette is saying that some authors that she know, they know about, I'm trying to get gender non-specific, but then I use phrases like Girl Friday, so I am so horribly archaic at times. Uh, some authors put their whole audiobook or several audio chapters up on YouTube for free. Is this a good marketing tactic? Will it drive listeners to purchase the book? Annette, I love this idea, and I tell my authors to do this all the time, especially if you're a fiction writer. If you are a novelist who has not broken out, if you are an unknown novelist, if you've got several books out there, but nobody seems, and by nobody, I mean you're selling three, maybe four books a week, you know, it's, you're just dribbling it. It's not working for you. Putting uh, your whole first book up as an audio book on YouTube is a fantastic way to get a bunch of new readers. There are people who share free audiobooks in these enormous sharing groups. They're, they're wonderful. And you can get hundreds, sometimes thousands of new readers, new fans that way. But it does not encourage people to then go and buy that book. But what it does do is it encourages them to go and spend money on your next book. This is not a good marketing tactic if you only have one book. But successful authors, just about every successful author I know, especially in the fiction realm, uh, they're constantly working on their next book. You have to be putting out a new book on a regular basis. So once you have three or four books, making one book available for free is a great way to get somebody to become your fan. It's zero risk. Or offer it for 99 cents as an ebook, keep the price really low, and then once they're hooked, they'll buy your other books at $3.99 or $4.99 or $5.99 as an ebook. Once they listen to your first book, and especially if it's a book that has a character that you're continuing on with another book, they will totally, probably, not in all cases, but in many cases, they'll be willing to buy your next audio book because you've proven yourself with your first. This is a marketing tactic that is still working. Not every marketing tactic that I've ever suggested that has been going on for a while is still working today, but that one, that one is absolutely working. All right. Uh, Wendy's asking about Luana for social media VA help. Her website is easybreezymarketing.com. Just Google easybreezymarketing.com and you will find Luana. Um, and, you know, I, I can drop her email into the chat box if you want. Hold on one second. Um, I don't have her, um, uh, her stuff memorized, but I adore her. And I am, you are very welcome to um, 
Let's see, Loanna Rodham, and her email is, all right, let me just, easybreezymarketing.com, here is her website. I am dropping it into the chat box. Tell her I said hi, she is awesome. And I, there you go, there's her website dropped into the chat box. I will also drop it into, the Facebook page if anyone's interested. All right. Uh, let me ask, answer another question from the emails here. Let's we see what's going on. Um, Linda P. Oh, she's got a lot going on here. But Linda P. is wanting to know if there's a way to identify a database of local libraries, especially libraries that are near colleges or university libraries or academic libraries, school libraries. Is there a way to find around a particular school or a particular area, academic libraries, school libraries, or public libraries? And the answer is yes. Uh, let me get you to that page. Guys, I'm gonna share my screen again. You guys are so patient with me. The way, the easiest way to do this, if you're looking for a specific type of library, share, Screen one. I hope you guys can see. I am at worldcat.org. Worldcat.org is a website that is run by OCLC. Uh, the OCLC uh, organization is an international group of, uh, and it's, it's a wonderful organization. It's way too much to go into. All you need to know is worldcat.org. Go to worldcat.org. And then if you arrow down, you can see the top 100 novels found in, in Worldcat libraries around the world. You can take a look at the most popular libraries. Right now, the most popular library in the United States is the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. That is getting more traffic than anyone else at the moment. But if you arrow down, you can actually click on find a library. Watch how easy this is. Now, Linda here is looking for libraries, university and academic libraries around interior design programs. So let's say New York City. I'm going to throw in um, I'm going to throw in a name here, New York City. All right, you may want to narrow your search. It says, all right, it came up with there's um, 40 different library branches in New York City. There's Brooklyn, there's the Bronx, there's Manhattan, but she wants academic libraries. So now let me click on this subtitle here. All right. There is the New York College of Technology, Catherine Gibbs School. Here is a list of all the libraries in the New York City area in and around uh, schools that might have an architecture department. But let's say you just want public libraries that um, are in and around New York City. Again, you can, you can throw in a zip code. You can, you, you, know, you can branch out as much as you want. Um, there's school libraries here. There's public libraries, and there's museums. Now, I actually got more libraries by simply typing in the city um, as opposed to the zip code, because the zip code, they were only giving that one zip code. So uh, what I would definitely do at that point, look at government libraries, the New York City Bureau of HIV Progressive Service, the New York City Department. Apparently, these people have libraries. There's government libraries there. Uh, Human Resources Administration. This resource at worldcat.org is a fantastic website. It's where we start for everything. So Linda, your question on how to find libraries. Now, I know you. it would be so much easier just to spend money and buy a database, but let me tell you my experience. Every cent I've ever spent on buying a database, whether it's a bookstore or a library database or anything, was a total waste of money. Not one penny of the money I've spent on purchased databases was worth it. They're cobbled together from, from conferences and from uh, you know, overseas web crawls and 90% of it's total waste. 90, 95% of the email addresses and the phone numbers that I've gotten from purchased databases were a complete waste. There's no, there's absolutely no um, substitute for doing your own research or hiring a VA to do the research. That's what I do. I have an in-house team that does, their, does our research here. And the reason why our library mailings get so many hits 
and bookstore mailings get so many clicks is because we're actually speaking to the librarians and the booksellers. And that is what you should do as well. All right, we've got a number of questions here. Let me get to, all right. Michael is writing a series of novels using a man as a protagonist who intersects with several strong women. Each woman has her own untold story that goes into a parallel series written under a different name. How does he name the second series? Um, hmm. Well, you know, Michael, one of the things you might want to do is if each woman has her own story, I'm believing that each woman has her own strength. Um, so each, if each woman is going to be spun off into their own series, then you say that this is about in, uh, strong women. I would take each woman, take the strength that she most exhibits, whether it's fortitude or trustworthiness or and come up with an interesting twist on that strength and you would name that next book for that woman um, something along the lines of whatever her main characteristic is as long as her main characteristic isn't you know good eyelashes uh, that that's one idea so taking a basic theme of a character is a great way to to name a book now naming a series quite often can be named after a person. If you've got an entire series, if you've written a book about Amy Collins, the sexy and intrepid book marketing expert who travels around on her victory motorcycle, which by the way, she does, and, um, and solves crimes. I don't do that, by the way. I commit them, I don't solve them. Um, if you're gonna write a series about Amy Collins, the crime fighting, motorcycle riding, book vixen, uh, then it could be something as simple as the Amy Collins series. It can also be the Motorcycle and Mayhem series. Um, so using characteristics or names is a great way to come up with a title. All right. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Sonia is, has a problem. Let's, let's see what Sonia's problem is. I'm reading this as we go. MailChimp, mm, MailChimp suspended her account. For, unsuspected, for an unspecified violation. She's thinking it's a mistake because she just uses it to collect addresses and to mail out her paperly newsletter. But their review process is taking forever. What do I do in the meantime? Shop for another service? The list is in baby stages and you have, she has no attachment to MailChimp. Absolutely. Sonia, if MailChimp can't get back to you within four or five business days, after four or five, that's it. And I'm saying that as someone is, I don't get back to people in four or five business days. You guys know. There are hundreds of you right now listening who have sent me emails that I have sometimes don't get back to for two weeks. That is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. I know it's unacceptable. I admit it. I'm sorry about it. I do the best I can. But if somebody doesn't get back to you by the end of a week, you know, if you've got five business days and you haven't heard back, that person is either too busy to work with you or they're stupid like I am and doing their best or, but it's not a good fit. Um, MailChimp is a big enough company that you should have heard back um, within five days. If you haven't heard back, move on to somebody else. Uh, there's lots of companies out there. I, I can't recommend anyone because unfortunately I use MailChimp, but um, I, I can't imagine that you were suspended realistically. It must be a glitch. And if they're not getting back to you, then I would send them a very strongly worded email right now telling them that time is up. All right. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Suzanne has two questions. Paula suggested that we join genre societies. Correct. Does that make sense for a memoir as well, since memoir topics are so varied? Well, Suzanne, a memoir is a nonfiction book. Uh, uh, she was talking about fiction. Um, a memoir is, is not... So um, for you, I would definitely go, it's Stephanie Chandler has a fantastic organization called the Nonfiction Authors something. Hold on, I'm gonna Google it real quick for you because this is, a, it's a great organization. Nonfiction Authors Association. It is the Nonfiction Authors Association. Stephanie Chandler, she is amazing. Um, I am going to drop, their information into the chat box right now. So um, truthfully, guys, um, if you are a memoirist, I know you think it's a, it's, it's, but it's not a novel. It's not a genre. It's, uh, you are a nonfiction writer. So, and memoir is not actually in most booksellers' mind the genre any more than nonfiction is a genre. Memoir is the starting point. So um, 
Suzanne, my question for you is, is your book self-help? Is it inspirational? Is it recent history? Is it political history? What kind of memoir is it? Is it a travel log? Books are rarely memoirs. I, I, I mean, it, what you may have written is a memoir, but if you wrote a memoir about your horrible childhood and your overcoming you know, terrible abuse and foster care, well, then that is more inspirational self-help. And that's a different genre than memoir. Memoir is just the starting point. Uh, Suzanne is saying, what is the best way to find similar stories for the nonfiction book proposal? Similar stories or similar books? Uh, Suzanne, I'd be happy to, to uh, direct you in how to find similar books. It's a pretty simple process. Uh, similar, so let's just, let's, I've done this before, but let's, let's go to the tape. Let's go online and, uh, you know, you can start, do not finish, but you can start at amazon.com. And uh, Suzanne, you've written a nonfiction memoir. So um, what I would do is I'd, I'd open up a Google tab and I would start with best-selling memoir. And uh, Amazon's best-selling memoirs, according to Google, Jessica Simpson, David Goggins, Trevor Noah, Michelle Obama, The Five Love Languages. Interesting that that's listed as a best-selling memoir. Kevin Hart. Now, Suzanne, I don't know what your book is about, but let's say you're let's say you're a therapist. Let's say you're a therapist or you're a mental health professional, and you're helping somebody overcome a bad ch uh, childhood. Then I would say that Lori Gottlieb's book, "Maybe You Should Talk to Someone," might be a good apples to apples comparison. So you click on that book, you arrow down to the book information. Oh, let's get off audiobook. Let's go to paperback, and you arrow down to the book information. And here's the best books on self-help. Here's the best books in biography memoirs. For Kindle, biography memoirs. Maybe your book is about fitness and dieting. I don't know, but this is how I get started. So if your book really is a self-help book, then what I would do is I would look for the best-selling authors in self-help. Whoops, not teens, excuse me, self-help. And then look at their books. So Brene Brown, definitely. Um, Gifts of Imperfection, Dare to Lead, Stephen Covey. Look at all these books. These are some wonderful books that you should start with. And that, guys, I mean, I know that, um, oh, now, I, apparently you guys weren't able to see my screen while I was doing that. So I'm going to very quickly run through that again, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, what I did was I went to Google. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to totally um, do that again. I'm going to go to Best Selling Memoir. On Google, my apologies, guys. I'm gonna right on Google. I'm gonna click on Amazon's best-selling memoir. I, I I'm guessing what Suzanne's book about, but I'm gonna make up that she's actually got a self-help book, uh, you know, about getting help. So then I click on a best-selling self-help memoir. If Suzanne's book is a paperback, I'll click on paperback. I'll arrow down to categories. Here we go. Best-selling books on self-help, look at these authors. And here are all the books I was just talking about. Brene Brown, Stephen Covey, Malcolm Gladwell. Here are some wonderful books to get started with. And you may say, oh my gosh, Atomic Habits, what's that about? Easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones. Oh no, my book isn't about that at all. Okay, so you skip that one. You just go back and you look more for Brene Brown, a little more, um, you know, The Gifts of Imperfection. Um, but at that point, you start, you start plowing around for the book, and you have to do some reading. You have to do some research. All right. Sorry that I uh, had to go through that twice for you guys. All right. Um, uh, for those of you who are asking about mailing programs, we've got some people. Somebody's recommending A. Weber. They like A. Weber. Linda's suggesting Mailer Light. She said she thought that was a good one. Uh, hey, Crystal, how are you? Good to see you. All right. Uh, let's see. Qu next question. Christine is getting inundated with phone calls from marketing agents that want to promote her books. They, uh, the costs range, the charges of what they charge, anywhere from 300 to, to thousands of dollars. Why so many companies? They email and they phone her on a regular basis. She's amazed that she has their phone number. How did she get a hold of them? Are any of these guys legitimate? They claim to find her by Amazon review. 
on positive reviews. So somebody, uh, probably at one of those VAs I was talking about, has gone in at somebody's request and harvested Christine's email address online and her phone number of her publishing company because she's got a lot of positive reviews on Amazon. And they are now targeting her for to hire them for marketing purposes. She wants to know if they're legitimate. Christine, I have no idea if they're legitimate. But I will tell you that is an odd practice. Companies that, that do well don't need to hunt people down and scoop up their email address and their phone numbers and then start harassing them on the phone. They don't have time for that. Um, I'd be a little nervous about any company that reaches out to you. You guys have heard me talk about this in book promotion. I do the same thing with my business. It's attraction, not promotion. Um, if somebody wants to hire me, they can hire me. I would love to take your money. I'd love to work for you guys, but I'm not calling you. You do not get three emails a day from me. You don't even get three emails a week from me. You may get five or six a month. You get five or six emails a month. You get my weekly newsletter where I give you all the articles and I don't ask for anything. I give you the articles I found interesting that week and two or three times a month, you will get an offer from me. Either I'm doing a bookstore mailing because I'm doing a bookstore mailing this week. I'm, I'm offering them for sale. That's the email you're getting this week. Next week, you're not going to get an email from me. I'm not offering anything. You will get an email reminding you that Jane Friedman will be here on Free Advice Friday next week, but I'm not selling anything. That's just free. So, Christine, I'm a little nervous about a company that's going to call you and email you over and over again and badger you to hire them. But I can't tell you that they're not legitimate. They may be very legitimate. I don't know. Sorry. All right. Let's go back to the questions online. Anna Carner is asking if her self-published book, is her self-published book prohibited from submission to the big guys? The New York Times book review, their site calls for books three to four months before publication. Okay, so Anna, your book, Anna and Blossom, is not eligible for Publishers Weekly, for Kirkus, for New York Times, for LA Times, none of those. Not because you're self-published, but because the book's already out. To submit your book to Kirkus, to submit your book to Forward, book list, New York Times, the big guys. You need to give four or even five months advance notice. A lot of the bloggers that I know, Christopher, Drew, the big bloggers who, who do big time book reviews, they need three or four months minimum, sometimes five. They need three or four months to, um, to put your book into the queue to consider it for review. So if your pub date is March or April, and here it is February, it's too late for you. But it's not because your book is, is self-published, it's because it's too late. Um, so your book would have been eligible. I have a lot, we, we submit books to Publishers Weekly and New York Times all the time. And a couple of my clients have gotten in. I've gotten Publisher Weekly reviews, I've gotten New York Times reviews from, and they're self-published authors, um, but we do it right. We do it four or five months out, we put the kits together, we do it properly, so. That's it. Uh, all right, now someone named Kate. Hi, Kate has raised your hand. Kate, I don't have any way of answering a raised hand, but for those of you who have questions, just go to the Q&A box right there and type the questions in. If, um, if you're calling in, I'm so sorry, I don't have a way to, to do that. This system doesn't allow for that, but I do answer questions that you email me each week. So if you've got a question that I don't get to this week, email me at questions at amysadvice.com. Questions at amysadvice.com is where to go to get in the queue, for instance, the ones that I'm answering now, and I answer, I go back and forth between live questions and questions that I answer that way. I am here every Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 Eastern, and it's getting to the point now that we are not able to get to all the questions. This is uh, it's a terrible problem to have, but it's a wonderful problem to have. The last few weeks, we've not been able to answer everyone's questions. And so I'm going to come up with a rule right now. We, we will answer all the questions we can as fast as we can every Friday, but any questions we don't get to, you're going to have to ask again next week. I, I have gotten to the point now, I'm so sorry, where I've been trying to answer. I write them down if you ask the previous week and I try and answer them first the next week but you guys are awesome and you've got so many great questions. I will try to be fair. I try very hard to, to, to pick and to choose and to make sure that I'm not giving anyone preferential treatment, but I gotta answer the question. All right, so Tammy's saying, she's got a copyright question for me. 
Tammy has the copyright registration in her name, but if she decides to incorporate, does she need to transfer the copyrights to the corporation name? No, Tammy, you don't. I can answer this question. Do you know if there's a charge for doing this? Do you typically advise clients to consider incorporating or do you work with people who stay as sole proprietors? Let me give you my take on this, Tammy. The copyright of your book belongs to you, the author. You as the author, Tammy, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna use last names. Um, you as the author with your legal name, your real name. What if Tammy isn't your real name? What if your name is actually Tabitha or something really cool like Tamantharana? Um, okay, I think I've just come up with a new favorite dinosaur. But um, Tammy, you, you get the copyright under your author name. The copyright belongs to you as an author. Now, if you are going to incorporate a publishing company instead of stay as a sole proprietor, I think that's a fantastic idea. I suggest that anyone who's going to seriously get into this business and start publishing a number of books should separate their personal finances from their business finances and their personal risk from their business risk. I'm an LLC. I'm an LLC. I file as an S Corp for under my publishing. I've got errors and omissions insurance. I, I've got general liability insurance. I do all of that, not as a sole proprietor. But I am 14 years old. My business is 14 years old. If you're just getting started, a sole proprietorship is fine. But the copyright does not transfer. Copyright belongs to you, the author. It will never belong to your corporation. So I hope that answers your question. All right. Uh, let's see. Crystal is saying she wants to know if I have a marketing plan example to share with us other than what I included in the sales sheet in the resource section of Real Fast Library Marketing Training. I do. Uh, it, it should be up there, but if it's not, Crystal, I'm sorry about that. Let me write this down. Um, I have an actual marketing checklist. It's a three page checklist of things that I think you should do. Now you're asking if I have a marketing plan example, if you mean, do I have a design kit that you can use? I don't. Um, we don't, uh, I mean, I don't, I, I have them. I, I, I sell them to my clients. I mean, I, I work on them, but but if you want to know about a marketing plan example, I do have that. There's, it's a three-page checklist and, and list of ideas that should be up there. But I'm going to double check when Free Advice Friday is over. If you're asking if I have an actual template of a pretty kit you can, be, you can put together, um, we do them here in-house. I, I don't actually have a, a kit. I can do that. Um, Linda's saying, how do you find bloggers and how do you determine which are the good ones? How do you find bloggers and how do you determine which ones are the good ones? All bloggers are good bloggers. All podcasters are good podcasters. Every podcast, every radio host, every blogger had to start somewhere. And whether or not they're good or bad, they deserve your attention. How do you find new authors and find out if they're any good? You give them a chance. So Linda, finding a blogger is super easy. I'm gonna walk you through it real quick, but I'm going to tell you there's no such thing as a good or a bad blogger. Now, there may be a blogger that's not a good fit for you. I had a podcaster who wanted to um, have me on uh, his show, but the focus of his business was the cleaning industry. Okay, that's not a good fit for me. However, did I go on his podcast? I did. Why? Because it was 20 minutes of my day and you have no idea who I might have helped. I say yes to everything. And Linda, you and Rick should say yes to everything too. So let's talk about how I would find a list of bloggers. Now, I have a list of bloggers in my possession, but let me tell you how I tell authors to go ahead. You go right to Google. Again, God and I, boy, I should really take out stock in Google the way I talk about them. And I find a book that is an apples to apples comparison to your book. Now, Linda, a very good apples to apples comparison of your book is the time travelers, one L, wife, and then I will say blog interview. So one of Rick's books, The Time Traveler's Wife. So here we go, an interview with Audrey Niffinger, who's the author of The Time Traveler's Wife, on a blog called, guys, I'm sorry I'm saying this, but it's called Book Slut. Okay, now this was an interview that happened in 2003. But Audrey Niffinger is a fantastic apples to apples comparison for, for Rick's book. So I start there, I click on Audrey's blog, and the last time she blogged was April 20th, 2016. So this is not a good fit. We're going to move on. 
this is not a good fit. But now I know that Audrey Niffinger is a great name. So what I will do now is I will click on Niff Nagger blog interview. I will now click on this and I will look for dates. All right, on writing and publishing. Okay, this is her blog. How cool would it be, Linda, if, if Audrey actually interviewed or, or you offered content for Audrey's blog herself? How cool would that be? All right, uh, let's see. So go to her website, Audrey Niffenegger, I'm pronouncing it wrong, and, and offer an interview or a content for her. Uh, Goodreads blog. Okay, so this this is all very dated. I wouldn't do this. So now you need to find another another book. Again, back to Amazon. Time. Let's see. You go to Audrey Niff and you Google her. Uh, her most recent book. Okay, that's why because her books are kind of old. That makes sense. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the Time Traveler's Wife. We're gonna click on it. We're gonna find out the best-selling books in her genre. We're gonna arrow down to time travel fiction, which you know, Linda, is a pretty good apples to apples comparison. Now, the number one book in time traveler fiction is The Enigma Cube by Douglas Richards. There's Paradox Bound by Peter Kleins. So let's click on that one. Let's take a look, see if it's a good fit, read a description. Oh yeah, great. This is a good apples to apples. So now I go back to Google and I type in Peter Klein. Blog interview. An interview with Paradox Bound author Peter Klein on geeknerdnet.com. There's a blog. This, this one looks like it's pretty recent. So go to the blog and find out when the last, okay, now they just blogged a couple of days ago. So here you go, geeknerdnet.com. Linda, I want you to go to geeknerdnet.com and pitch them uh, an interview or, or a copy of Rick's book. And that is a, I, I hope you guys, I didn't bore you. Um, just wanted you to know that that's how, that's how I do it. And, and it's time consuming, which is why when people hire me to do blog work for them and review work for them, it costs, costs a lot of money. We charge $1,600 to get 20 or 30 reviews and 20 or 30 blog interviews. And, you know, we, we put this, it takes two, three months of our time and we charge what we charge, not because, you know, I'm greedy, I'm not, but because it takes a lot of time and you have to craft them. You can't just grab a list online. I wish it was that easy. I wish that for $99, I could just sell you guys a list of bloggers, but they change. They change so fast. All right. Uh, let's see. In case there's time, Sue put in a question here at 1020. Well, I know Sue, but, uh, but you've asked, I, I have, I'm trying to get to everyone's questions as fast as I can. I'm trying to, to, to be fair and, and pick questions from everyone. Um, but so let's see what Sue's is. Uh, she's got a question about workbooks. Her book has action pages to help the reader make a transformation. She was told that promoters don't like workbooks. She signed up for a marketing pack. Oh, um, the libraries. Libraries can't take a workbook. You can't, you can, if, if, if you had a promotion working with us that sold into the libraries, libraries can't take a book that you write in uh, because it encourages people, even if the library says don't write in it, people are going to, and then the book is useless to them. It's ruined. Should she turn it into two books, one without the workbook pages and one with, yes, if libraries are important to you, if you don't care about libraries, or if taking out the workbook pages is going to turn it into a 50-page booklet, don't bother. Libraries won't take that either. Um, oh, she says, if so, a book without worksheets would only be about 50 pages. Um, no, Sue, so, so that is not a good fit for libraries. It's a great fit for everywhere else, but the library market will not. A 50-page book uh, that, was, that was supposed to be a workbook that we've just stripped out, the, that's not a good, a good fit. You're going to have to skip the libraries for this one. And when your next book is written that doesn't have a worksheet, then you can focus on libraries. Um, bookstores love libraries, self-help websites love libraries, Amazon, excuse me, bookstores love workbooks, self-help websites and self-help stores love workbooks, Amazon loves workbooks, libraries don't. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Crystal saying, what type of services do you offer self-published authors? Crystal, that is so, I'm so glad you asked. We are actually putting together a whole new list of offerings and it's going to be up on the website in about, we're working on a new website in about two weeks. The, in general, we offer uh, review work. We, we're very good at getting reviews for authors. We're very good at getting podcasts and blog uh, interviews for authors. I'm very good at getting you into bookstores and libraries. There's things I'm not good at. I'm not a publicist. I can't get you on Ellen. I can't get you onto The View. I, I wouldn't know how. So we don't do publicity, but we do do bookstore marketing. I can get you into libraries. I can, do, uh, I can create a marketing plan for you. We do uh, programs where we'll actually launch your book for three months or four months. We'll actually take your book from start to finish and launch it for you into the industry and get you tons of, of reviews and lots of, of attention. And uh, we don't do a lot of social media work here. We do do some for our authors, but we found that social media works best when you, the author, do it yourself. Trying to get someone to hire to do it for you is tough. But we do create videos and images that you can use, and we do a lot of online advertising for people. So that, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I will, uh, I, I'll have more information for you guys when the new website goes up in a couple of weeks. 